GC Live fam, what is up? Uh, Wes Mitchell here, Chris Clark. Thursday episode of the show. I had to double check. It is indeed Thursday. Um, we got we got a great show lined up for you here today. We've got Mark Passwaters from AggieYell.com. He is filling in the role um, for every single week. We, we have somebody on to talk about the opponent. Um, no Jimbo Fisher, but we do have Mark Passwaters who's going to come on and talk a bit about the Aggies, he that is, of course, the Texas A&M rival site that that he runs. So he'll come on and give us some great insight and someone that I believe Chris has been on the show uh, before. So uh, we'll be good to hear from him about what is really, honestly, a, a really good Texas A&M team that South Carolina will travel to uh, to Kyle Field to take on Saturday night. That is a evening kickoff on SEC Network, and this show is, of course, brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond of the Mortgage Network. ClintHammond.com. If you're on the video version of the show, you see it right above our heads every single day. 803-771-6933. Clint, the presenting sponsor. He is the branch manager of the Columbia Mortgage Network, NMLS number 71597. And then the letter C, Hammond, at MortgageNetwork.com is how you can also reach out and see Clint. There you see Clint's smiling face in what is surely a BP Skinner suit. Um, Got got to be, got to be, got to uh, be. Any anybody that's um, getting a suit in the Columbia area goes through our boy Brent Skinner. So, all right, y'all. Um, like I said, we'll be joined by Mark. He'll be on to talk about A and M here in actually about six minutes, uh, two ten p.m. Eastern for those who are live. Shout out to everybody already getting in the chat. Uh, what's up, guys? Craig is in. Uh, Gamecock Chuck is in. Paul Coleman is in. Um, Paul, I don't know if you're a usual chatter, man. So, so welcome in, um, Mark, aka throw the ball to EJ Jenkins every single time that you snap the football. Anderson is in the chat as well. What's up, guys? Hope y'all are well. Chris, um, you did not manage to to burn the place down yesterday without me. No. Um, you only got a few copyright strikes I saw on YouTube um, as I loaded the show up today. Mm. But um, all in all, uh, you, you managed not to burn the house down. Dude, YouTube. I wonder what this copyright strikes are for. Could it be our new outro? Could it be the clip? So if if they are smart enough, you know how smart they are with the copyright stuff. If they took the video that somebody else had already ripped from YouTube that I then took and ripped and then displayed on the screen, that is highly impressive. Oh, I was almost guaranteed. Although, did, I mean, did you like, use the new outro? I used the new outro. I did. Oh, yeah. Then that's definitely one of them. The new outro is a no-go. Unless are, we are have you? a new, new outro. The new, new outro is a no-go? Do we have a new, new outro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How new I is think, it? Uh, yesterday was the first day we debuted it. Now, oh, okay. it, it, okay, it is based on the outro we did during our Firehouse Subs lunches with Jaheim Bell and Jalen Foster. And those, in terms of the music, I thought I got the music cleared. So I'm kind of, I'm racking my brain on, on what copyright strikes may have been in place. I don't know. Well, YouTube, YouTube is out to get us. Um, they are, man. They don't. But they I don't am, when, I, when I went to, so y'all, there's like a little menu of things you can click. When I went to click um, the show intro today. Chris has loaded like every single play from the last two weeks. So I'm guessing YouTube uh, or SEC Network or ES, somebody did not enjoy those clips. But um, I want to play them right now just out of spite, to be honest with you. But um, <laughs> just to see if it, but that, that algorithm, man, is like oh, it's, next level. It, it's well, insane. We need, we Although, need that to apply that to like other things within our job. Like, can we? St- 
take that al- algorithm and like apply it to like getting information or being able to predict games or something be awesome. Although there, there, I swear there was one time that the algorithm got us and it was because somebody had ripped a video from us and, um, and used it and it, it copyrighted us when it was our video. So, um, sometimes it's, it's too smart for its own good. Um, anyway, man, uh, press conferences were yesterday. The, the off the offensive talk is just I don't know, man. I, I feel like we all are just re- repeating ourselves oh, yeah. into the ether over and over at this point. Well, that that's the thing that the, the most repeatable thing at this point. No, I won't even say that. You're right. Just about everything's been repeated. Per, you know, haven't been able to run the ball, so perimeter run and need to t- cut down on the mistakes. We've, we're hearing a lot of the same stuff. The thing that was kind of funny to me is we have, I said this yesterday, Wes, we've gone from this thing where it was going to be Luke Doty to open the season, right? And then when it wasn't Luke Doty and Zeb was stepping in, how does the offense change now that Zeb Nolan's in? And then when Luke Doty came back, how's the offense change when, now that Luke Doty's in? And now that Zeb Nolan's back, how's the offense change now that Zeb Nolan's back? And so it was kind of interesting. Marcus Satterfield said, you know, the offense is not going to be that different. But he did outline – some different things within it, right? You're going to at least try or to play to the strengths of your quarterback. You're probably going to go under center more. You're going to use more play action. You're not going to have as, I think he termed it as run friendly an environment for Zeb Nolan as you did for Luke Doty. So there will be some differences there. Again, a lot of talk about got to get the ball to the playmakers, Jaheim Bell, Juju McDowell, the two guys that he specifically mentioned there. And no doubt that'll, all those things will be key for South Carolina. Now, can they take it from talking about it to putting it on the field? That's obviously the million dollar question. Yeah, you know, and I, I think they've actually done a pretty good job the last couple of weeks of getting Jaheim the football. Um, you know, I, I actually wrote a story on Gamecock Central today uh, with some of those quotes from Satterfield. I I dove into some of our quotes actually from our two uh, firehouse sub sit downs with. Jaheim Bell and Jalen Foster. Uh, Jalen basically gets to see Jaheim up close and personal every single day in practice. And he's like, without, you know, without hesitating, he's like, that guy's a dog. Like any, any, anytime a player um, calls another player a dog, that's like the ultimate sign of respect. I high praise. Uh, so, so yeah, the very high praise. Jalen obviously with high praise for Jaheim, but dude, he's got a, uh, He's got 16 catches this year. Ten of them are in the last two games. So, you know, when, when they say they're they're making this concerted effort to get him the football, you know, hats off. They they have done that. Uh, you know, they even plugged him in there at, at kickoff return as well with Juju McDowell out. Dude, that that said, you know, when when you sort of said it a second ago, it kind of um, made me think the. Can, can they do those two things? Yes. Like, I, I think they've showed us when they say, ah, we want to get the ball to a guy. Like, they'll get him the ball. I, I think my question is, will it matter? Like, uh, you know, you, you start looking at this offense, man. Four, four of the seven games, they have been right within a couple of points of basically three touchdowns, like a three touchdown total for South Carolina. So they're, they're averaging right at 21, 22 points a game. And four of the seven are, are right there around it. They've scored, uh, you know, a little bit less against Georgia, you know, 13 against Georgia, I guess, 10 against Kentucky, um, a good bit more against Eastern Illinois. But, you know, the other, the other four games, it's been, I mean, good grief. If you want to talk about like accuracy from a standpoint of hitting the same target every time, if, if three touchdowns per game won SEC games these days, then, uh, you know, we're having a different story. But it's just the, the weird – the really weird thing for me, man, is that even when we have seen some improvements in certain areas, we haven't necessarily seen the output from a scoring standpoint change. Yeah, and if it's not one thing, it's another. You know, they did – you know, they moved the ball better against Vanderbilt than we saw, you know, against Tennessee, for instance. Now, one obvious reason for that, Wes, is, well, Vanderbilt's not very good, uh, you know, in any phase of the game, and that's particularly so on defense. While 
Whereas Tennessee actually has been probably a lot better than people anticipated defensively. That, that was a side of the ball where coming in this year, people said, hey, they're going to score some points under Josh Heupel with that offensive system, but the defense is going to be atrocious because they lost so many guys. Instead, they've been solid on that side for the most part, you know, a lot better than anticipated, certainly. And so there was going to be some drop off. You know, if South Carolina lined up against Vandy and couldn't do anything. That would have been even – I mean, we're sitting here sounding the alarm, right? But that would have been a full-fledged, you know, what do they call it, a five alarm, whatever. I mean, it would have been even worse. Um, that said, it's still, like you said, the production is not good enough. And 21 points back in the day in the SEC, yeah, that might have worked. It does not now, as we know. And so you got to do a lot better than that. Last week it was more of very untimely mistakes and turnovers. So – they just – they've had a combination, you know, of all those different things. No doubt. Uh, let's go out now to our Primal Gourmet chat line with our special guest, AggieYells.com. AggieYell.coms, I should say. Mark Passwaters. Mark, uh, how's it going out there today, man? Uh, warm and humid, as usual. But, uh, you know, same old same. Okay, cool, man. Yeah, we, we appreciate the time. I uh, wanted to get you on to uh, inform our listeners and readers and viewers a, a little bit more about this Texas A&M team. Um, obviously, um, uh, you know, pretty impressive year so far for them. The big win over Alabama, obviously, it is the signature win at this point. They've had to endure, uh, you know, replacing a quarterback due to injury. Um, I, I guess, big picture-wise, what what is the first thing a Gamecock fan who has not watched much A&M football this year needs to know about the Aggies? Uh, they're going to run the football. That's that's the big thing. Uh, I think uh, Isaiah Spiller and Devon A-Chain have developed into the best one-two punch, not just in the SEC, but in the country. They've been very good. They ran for 292 yards on their own last weekend against Missouri, which unfortunately isn't saying a whole lot because Mizzou's terrible. Uh, they're dead last against the run, and they proved why uh, against the Aggies. But – with the changes that they've had up front, losing Haynes King, going to Zach Calzada, uh, this is what they've had to do. And the last few weeks, they the offensive line has really kind of hit its stride. They've had a lot of changes up front, but they've played a whole lot better. Te- a team that was struggling to score points, 10 points against Colorado, 10 points against Arkansas, 22 against uh, Mississippi State, all of a sudden 41 against Alabama 35 last weekend and if they really wanted to they could have run that score up pretty badly so this is a team that's starting to hit its stride certainly this they didn't expect to be five and two at this point I don't think anybody expected to be five and two they expected to be six and one or seven and oh um so they, there's been some disappointment but it seems like this team's starting to hit its stride and maybe can show that it is a top 10 team after all And Mark, you mentioned this team hitting its stride. So that's what I was going to actually ask you next, the direction I was going to go. Is this team and how they're playing right now, is that the identity of this team or do we still not quite know? And and here's the reason I ask that. You know, obviously, like you said, the season didn't start as they thought. You you dropped the game, the neutral site game to Arkansas, who's a pretty good team. Mm -hmm. Dropped the home game to Mississippi State. Um, Missouri, not a good team, got destroyed by Tennessee, et cetera. So you've got those results, and then you've got beating Alabama at home. Like, is Alabama more the outlier and still trying to figure out this team, or is there a good bit of confidence that the team that's been on the field the past couple weeks and beaten then number one Alabama and beaten Missouri roundly, is that the identity of this team and how good they are? Well, Jimbo Fisher likes to talk about all three phases of the game, offense, defense, special teams. And they've been able to click in all three areas the last couple of weeks. Um, The offensive line was a big, big problem for the first five weeks of the season. Then for whatever reason, it clicked against Alabama. Everything worked. It clicked last week against uh, Missouri. Kenyon Green was the SEC offensive lineman of the week. And you could easily argue that he had the third best performance on the line behind Layden Robinson, the other guard, the right guard. Uh, who South Carolina fans may remember coming in last year, and true freshman Bryce Foster, who has come in at center. And he was put in a tough spot, but he's the former five-star has really done a good job, especially the last couple of weeks. And I think this is this is the what the team has to be. 
losing King was a huge blow because this is a guy who could run. He was a very good passer. Calzada has been hit or miss. So I think that they kind of needed to go back to the 2020 scheme where you lean on people, you run the football. Kellen Mond was a great game manager who really exploded in the, the USC game last year and rode that to a, a great season uh, for the rest of the way in 2020. And I think that's what the, Calzada needs to do is he needs to be more of a game manager, even though he's got that rocket arm and just kind of rely on six and 28 a chain and spiller to, to kind of carry the load. And then when he needs to make a play, he needs to be able to make it. Let, let's stay with Calzada there. Um, when, when he is uh, good, when he is on, when it's clicking, when he's at his best, um, what can we expect from him? Like if he gets in a groove, um, you know, what, what is he capable of? And then the other side, what maybe are some of the areas that you feel like Jimbo Fisher is maybe focused on trying to improve the most with him, Mark? Well, I think consistency is the the big thing for him. He he can make all the throws. There's absolutely no question. Uh, going back to the days of R.C. Slocum, when they have talked about an AM quarterback having a big arm, they say he can throw the ball to Navasota, which is about 20 miles from College Station. My response for Calzada the first year and a half of his career was, yeah, but his receiver's in Milliken, which is about 15 miles from College <laughs> Station. He has started to show more consistency the last couple of weeks. He was fantastic against Alabama. There, there's no doubt. That might have been the best quarterback performance against the Tide since maybe Deshaun Watson in the national championship game, uh, maybe even Johnny Manziel back in 2012. Uh, he, he just made all the throws, and that's the thing that he can do. He can fit passes into tight windows with his arm. Uh, he can make the plays down the field. His big deal really is the shorter passes. Check the ball down. That was his struggle last week against Mizzou is he had Spiller and A-Chain in the flat several times, and they could have run all day. We're talking 70-yard touchdowns untouched. They were so open, and he missed them. Uh, that He can throw a rocket 40 yards. The problem is he also throws the same rocket four yards. So trying to get him to develop a little bit more touch, just be more consistent, I think those are the things that they're looking for. But if they can start to run the football against USC and they can, you know, kind of establish the line of scrimmage, then they may go some play action because Demond Demas is a guy who can really run. Anaya Smith needs no introduction, but I think they may have Caleb Chapman back this week. And if that's the case, then they have three guys who can really stretch the field. So in addition to Calzada, just, you know, continuing to come along in terms of the short passing game, obviously, as you outlined earlier, Mark, the offense struggled against Colorado, against Arkansas, 10 points each in those games, but have picked it up lately, of course. Alabama, a great example of that. That said, what are some other areas, aside from Calzada's short passing game, where you see, you know, the need to improve for this team? And any, you know, spots that South Carolina, if they play well in this game, could potentially be poised to maybe take advantage of? Well, I think that uh, the offensive line needs to continue to improve. Uh, they've they've really done well the last couple of weeks. 810 yards of total offense, uh, 76 points, uh, one sack. That's been the big thing. They gave up 13 sacks in the first five games. And they need to continue to uh protect Kells out of the way they have the past couple of weeks because if you get the heat on him then he gets jittery they gets the happy feet and starts uh running when he shouldn't he's done a good job of not doing that the last couple of weeks but you don't want to have that problem start to to raise its ugly head again outside of that i think the big thing is just seeing the receivers consistently catch the football and the guy i'm thinking of most is jalen weidemeyer guy who had two touchdowns last year against the Gamecocks in Columbia has had a lot of drops this year. And we're talking about a potential first round tight end, a Mackey award finalist last year. And he needs to really get that going. He seems to be a little better catching the ball the last couple of weeks, but you still want to see more from that because he's a critical element of that offense. I mean, the big three are Spiller, Smith and Weidermeyer. And if all three of those guys are clicking, then the ball's going to move down the field, but you've got to have those guys all playing consistently. 
Smith has four touchdowns the last two games. Spiller's been fantastic all year. Now the onus is on Weidermeyer to pick it up. Yeah, I was surprised uh, looking through the PFF grades to see Weidermeyer not one of the more highly graded guys on this team. And I, I guess that stems from those drops because obviously – um, the dude is is a mismatch waiting to happen pretty much every single time. I, my view may be a little bit skewed by, like you said, watching what he did to South Carolina last year. But the overall stats have been solid. But uh, the uh, the grading system that PFF uses, I'm, I'm guessing uh, the drops probably probably hurt him quite a bit. Um, but let's go to the defensive side of the ball for a minute. Uh, when I think of A&M, I think of uh, defensive linemen. I think of guys that are just – the last, I, I don't know how many years, they've been very disruptive against South Carolina up front. Um, give give the Gamecock fans on here a, a little bit of rundown of uh, what I, I believe are several uh, just really talented defensive linemen on this A&M front. Well, if they're expecting a break, uh, then they're not going to get it this week because the Aggies have a very good defensive line again this year. I think what you're going to see is two seniors on the edge that's Michael Clemens and Tyree Johnson. Johnson had a good game against Carolina last year. Michael Clemens was out. And when he went down last season, he was leading the team in sacks with four. He's got four sacks again this year. Uh, Johnson has four sacks this year. But the guy that we haven't even talked about yet is the best of the bunch, and that's DeMarvin Leal. And Leal was a defensive end exclusively last year. This year, he's flexing between defensive tackle and defensive end. Uh, you're talking about a guy who's 6'4", 295, has the speed to beat people off the edge, has the strength to dominate on the interior, and he's done both this year. He leads the team in sacks with five and a half. He's second on the team in tackles for loss. He's he's an All-American, and he's proving it. Then you add in Jaden Peavy, who is a fifth-year senior, who missed last week, but he has played extremely well this season. So those are going to be the four guys up front. You're dealing with a lot of experience, a lot of size, especially in the interior and guys who can get off the edge and get after the quarterback. And, uh, you know, that may be a problem for Carolina because they've had trouble protecting Doty and uh, Nolan, uh, you know, from what I can tell, you know, for the better part of the season. You're right, uh, Mark, and especially, you know, the other added part of that is the run game for South Carolina, the one area that was expected to, you know, maybe be a relative strength of this football team that haven't been able to get going. I just remember that game last season in Columbia, which was obviously a turning point for the Gamecocks that season and really for the for the Will Muschamp era. And I, I literally went – when some of A&M's defensive linemen ran on the field in that game, I think they had kind of a line change. They put the first group and the second group out. I literally laughed out loud. I think it was Bobby Brown seeing him run on the field. Yeah. I laughed out loud because of how he looked. He was – as wide as the entire defensive line and could absolutely fly. Um, so they don't have him anymore playing for the Rams now, but they do have a lot of others, as you said. Um, I actually want to talk about a, another turning point thing here, um, or what will not be a turning point at AM, but Jimbo Fisher, um, what I could catch, because he's kind of hard to understand sometimes in his press conferences, he did address the LSU opening the other day, right? Give us a little bit of a sense of that, like what the vibe has been around there, what he said in regards to the LSU opening, because that obviously, you know, created a lot of conversation. Uh, it was the most word-filled minute and four seconds in human history. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, I, I told Jimbo, I've told Jimbo several times, I don't even try to transcribe you. I type 120 words a minute. I can't keep up with the man. I use the the Otter uh, widget on the computer, and I swear to God, it a couple of times it said "screw this." I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> but, you know, it, but in that minute and four seconds, he basically said, "I love a And M. I don't want to go anywhere. I am interested in fulfilling my contract. I think we have we're building something special here." Uh, he said, "No offense to LSU. It's a great place. We won championships there. But this is where I want to be." Uh, you know, I love it here. I think he said, I love it here five different times. And as soon as he got done, his wife tweeted out, I love it here too. So it sounds like he would, he was warmed up and ready to, to make that comment. But, uh, you know, I took him at face value. I may be a fool, but I tend to do that with coaches. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take him at their word. You know, I figured that if he was really interested in LSU, 
uh, that he would have dodged it. You know, he would have said, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this team. You know, you guys know how it goes when, when a coach <laughs> wants to dodge. You know, they don't they don't go on a, a minute and a half di- or a minute and five second diatribe about why they love where they are and don't want to leave. And, and Jimbo Fisher with also revealing multiple ranges in the state of Texas, right? Is that right? That, that's nice. Multiple, not not just one ranch, but multiple ranches. Can you give us any scoop on the uh, on the ranches that Jimbo Fisher has in Texas and hunting ground. <laughs> well, all I know is that when I retire, I want a ranch. I don't want ranches, but then again, I'm not making nine million bucks a year. This is true. Yeah, you know, but you know, the area. If you've ever been to to Bryan College Station. The area around it is beautiful. It's the Brazos Valley. It's very hilly, a lot of a uh, lot of open space. It's especially gorgeous in the spring. It's I think it's God's country from February to May, especially. But you know, for him to sit there and say, "I have ranches," I you know, my family has ties here. You know that that was pretty definitive. And ranches, I mean that you know plural, yeah. <laughs> man, I'm in the wrong line of work. I should have been a coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Mark, I, I was going to ask uh, along the same lines, uh, the decision, uh, I was just trying to find the date, I believe I believe it was late August. Uh, A&M sort of went ahead and, and gave Jimbo the, the big extension. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, that aren't there on the ground at, at A&M nationally are saying, well, was that necessary? Uh what was the thought process from what you gathered uh, there locally? And, and and was a little bit of that, hey, there, there may you, – you know how stuff probably circulates mm-hmm. behind closed doors uh, yeah. a lot sooner than it starts to, to maybe uh, roll out other places. Was that a little bit of A&M saying, let's just go ahead and, uh, and be a little bit maybe proactive uh, in this thing? I think you're, you're dead on. I, I, I really think that – they realized that LSU was at the end of their string with Ed Orgeron. And, you know, the stories that have come out since their mutual decision to for him <laughs> to go, you know, it sounds like he had a track record of being a real sleazeball. So you to understand this fully, you have to go back to 2017 at AM when Scott Woodward was the athletic director at AM, he started sounding people out about the A&M job before the Aggies even took the field in 2017. He was pretty intent on getting rid of Kevin Sumlin. And after they went out to the Rose Bowl and blew a huge lead and lost 45-44, when we were leaving the ballpark, uh, a friend of mine said, watch the name Jimbo Fisher. Mm. And I said, you're out of your freaking mind. Uh, Well, they were dead on. By the Arkansas game five weeks later or four weeks later, you know, the name was coming up repeatedly. And by November, we had a pretty darn good idea that one, someone was toast, and two, Jimbo was going to be the guy barring a remarkable change of events. You know, they, they, there was no pen to paper yet or anything like that. But there was there was pretty good agreement that all the signs are pointing towards Fisher coming. So... Who's the athletic director at LSU now? Scott Woodward. When did he start inquiring about getting rid of his coach in 2017? The summer, August. All of a sudden, Jimbo has an extension and a pay raise. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. You know, if you guys are just being buddy-buddy, why are you doing it now? They weren't just being buddy-buddy. They were were darn sure that LSU was going to make another run at him. And even though Jimbo probably wouldn't have been interested without the pay raise. You know, they, they were making sure that they kept their guy. And I think that uh, barring something incredible happening, he's going to be at a and Yep. Yeah. And Jimbo's agent, Jim, Jimmy Sexton, right? Jimbo mm-hmm. Fisher's agent. So, of course, making move. The kingmaker, as they call him. Mm-hmm. So, to go back to the game, last one I've got for you, Mark, before uh, I pass you off to Wes and we let you run. Defensive secondary for A&M. Lots of talent. You know, in that group, Damani Richardson, uh, you know, Leon O'Neill, a couple highly recruited guys, and, and more, obviously. South Carolina has actually had a little bit more success than anticipated in the passing game. Very very inconsistent, right? But they've had some moments there. What can you tell us about this secondary and how they played for the Aggies so far? 
Well, this could be a problem area for the Aggies because two of the guys they were really counting on at corner, uh, Miles Jones and Brian George, two seniors, are out for the year. They both got foot injuries, you know, bang, bang, and they were gone. So the Aggies have been relying on Jalen Jones, a sophomore, and Tyreek Chappell, a true freshman at corner. So that's a bit of an issue. They're kind of thin there. The safety play has been fantastic. Uh, Leon O'Neal is having the best season of his career. Damani Richardson has been consistently good. The guy to really watch, though, is Antonio Johnson, the nickel. This kid is special. Uh, he's second on the team in tackles. He had his first career interception last weekend at Mizzou. The kid just flies all over the field. He has safety size. He's six foot three, but he has the ability to cover like a corner. And that has been one of the saving graces for this football team is the fact that you have a guy that can go out there like him and take a slot receiver and basically take him away. But in the running game, he can also get up close to the line of scrimmage and isn't afraid to throw his body around and knock somebody to the floor. Final uh, thing I've got as well here, Mark. Uh, let, let's talk matchups. Let's talk keys to victory. Um, how, how do you see this game playing out? Um, what, what are some areas that, that you'll maybe be paying uh, most attention to uh, with South Carolina versus Texas a and on Saturday night? Well, I just put up, actually just put up my uh, my second game preview, the the Carolina offense against AM's defense. So this is kind of fresh in my mind. Basically, if I'm AM, I want to go out there and just bully Carolina. I want to go out there and be physical, run the ball as much as I can. You know, when Calzada needs to make plays, if you can push it down the field, great. But the big thing is to go out and pound on that off that defensive line, which you know. It's banged up and it's a little bit undersized. And we saw what AM can do against an undersized defensive line last week against Missouri. You know, you want to go out there, possess the ball, you know, just keep pounding away. And then on the other side, do what opposing defenses have done pretty consistently and get pressure into the backfield. Move that Carolina offensive line backwards, take away the run. And even though I said that I think the best bet for Carolina is going to be to throw you know, to let Nolan try to, to get the ball down the field. I think AM will probably be of the opinion that, okay, that's what we want them to do because we want to take away the run. We want to take away Harris and White and Marshawn Lloyd if he can go um, and basically make them one-dimensional, make them throw, and then you can get those guys, the the Clemens, the Leal, Tyree Johnson, get those guys into the backfield and try to force uh, bad throws, maybe some more turnovers, uh, you know, th things of that sort, you know, just basically go out there, use your size, use your physical nature to try to control this football game. It's what they did last year. I know things have changed. You know, the schemes are different, but I think the game plan for AM will probably be very similar in that respect. Mark, uh, great stuff, man. We appreciate the time as always. Um, that's all I got on the football side, but uh, hey, we, I, I saw on your Twitter, uh, you're a pretty big Astros fan. Is that, is that right? I live in Houston, so it's kind of a, a given. So are, are we going to get a Braves-Astros World Series? Wouldn't mind it one bit. <laughs> I, same, I, I same, mean, same. It, it'll be a minor miracle if the, the Strohs actually make it with all the injuries to the pitching staff. But Fran Valdez yesterday was an absolute godsend. That's what they needed. You know, now you can go into game six with a fresh bullpen. Uh, you know, I think Boston's a little – Shell shocked at what's happened the last couple of days, mm -hmm. but maybe they got a shot at finishing them off. And I despise the Dodgers. I don't like the Braves, but I really despise the Dodgers. So seeing them get knocked out would just be Christmas, you know. So having the the Astros and Braves go at it, you know that that would you know from an from an Astros fans perspective that would be optimal, you know. So let's go, let's have it happen. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, man. That, that'll be fun. Uh, hopefully. Maybe both teams close it out here soon and uh, we'll get a little break and then we'll, we'll go do it, man. Uh, Mark, we appreciate the time again. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, okay? All right. Take care, guys. Yeah, that's Mark. Passwaters. Go check them out. AggieYell.com. Man, I hope that happens. We, have, we haven't talked about the game any, Chris. Um, dude, so Urias for the Dodgers. I saw this. We're, we're going to get back to football, y'all, I promise. But I got I to gotta talk about this real quick. He has not given up three home runs in a game in over five years. And last night he gave up three home runs 
within the first 11 batters of the baseball game. Yeah. So if that's not a, like, that's baseball stat for you, I, I don't know what is. It, Eddie Rosario literally in the playoffs going for the second cycle in Major League Baseball history as far as playoff games go, postseason games. And instead of getting the double, he hit the thing too far and hit yeah. his second home run um, of yeah. uh, of the game, making him just the second player in baseball history to have four hits, two home runs, including also a triple as his stat line. So uh, I, I know it's a football show, man. I had to work that in there for, for a second. And uh, hopefully the Braves – Close this thing out tonight, man. But insane what happened yesterday. I, I, I don't want to be dramatic, Wes, but I think uh, Eddie Rosario, greatest baseball player in history, probably. Uh, dude, that guy, how about, seriously, though, the Braves gave up Pablo Sandoval for him. I think they got – they gave up Pablo and they got Eddie Rosario in cash. I was uh, – I was actually texting with noted Cleveland Indians or Guardians fan Kev Roche last night about that. And we were going back and forth a little bit about Eddie Rosario. But, dude, he's been awesome. You lose Acuna, you get Duvall, you get him. I mean, it's been fun to watch. And the the other it's baseball stat, right? I know the game before last was game three was a huge bummer, right? To, to lose how the Braves lost. They blew the lead. Cody Bellinger, heartbreaker again. Did you see the other stat on that one about that pitch? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I didn't see the stat, but I know that everybody has been hammering poor Luke Jackson. Yeah. And I'm like, that. there's no, there's no reason that ball should have been hit out of the park. Like, it was like no high. reason. Yeah, so this was passed on – this guy, uh, this is per MLB, and a guy, Josh Claiborne, on Twitter, who was tweeting at your guys from the uh, JB and Goldwater show, actually. So I can't verify this, but it sounds right. Per MLB, since 2015, MLB pitchers had thrown more than 31,000 fastballs that were at least 95 miles an hour and at least four feet high. Only 61 of them were a hit, and only nine of them became a home run. So that was How a pretty many pitches? Good 31,000 fastballs. So, I mean, what did I say? 61. Only 61 were even a hit. But only nine were home runs. Yeah, so, I mean, that's... What is that I mean, math? It's a super small percent. Well, and Bellinger has been awful this season and had been terrible at, at high fastballs, apparently, from what the Dodgers fans say. So... I don't know, man. I, I felt for Luke Jackson. Some, But honestly, the Braves losing that game, probably just as improbable as the Braves coming back in game two, uh, considering, you know, everything that happened in that game. So it's been a weird series. On on paper, you'd think the Braves could close it out tonight. But this series, has, none of it has been on paper. Like, <laughs> it, it's been played out the opposite of what you would expect it to be on paper. So... Who knows, man? But you got to feel good about about free about Freed being on the mound for the Braves, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But yeah, Eddie Rosario, the best, uh, certainly the best hitter of all time. The last couple of games, like it, I mean, he has two four hit games in just the NLCS, which is uh, insane. And I, you know what? This whole well, I saw last year up three one completely different team than last year y'all that that team had max freed as a starter and a bunch of rookies literally a bunch of rookies as starters and you played all seven games back to back to back to back to back to back to back so if you so so that basically depletes your your pitching staff this is a more traditional um in lcs it's just it's just different you You've got home field advantage, and you have in these final three games, you have Max Freed, Ian Anderson, and Charlie Morton set up to be your starters. So I, I don't think it compares to last year at all. Could the Braves lose? Of course, it's sports, it could happen. But a team has never come back from being down 3 1 
in back-to-back postseasons. I saw that on The Athletic today. It's literally never happened. So we'll see. It'll be fun. But, uh, man, that that was awesome yesterday. Uh, Appreciate y'all letting me get my Braves fanhood in here. I mean, a lot of y'all in the chat, I know not all of you, but a lot of you are Braves fans as well. So that's uh, that's been really fun, man. Um, I got I got my my Brave shirt ready for tonight to to watch and and close this thing out. Uh, let, let's go back to the football game. On paper, I I, I distinctly remember Chris. This uh, we did one of our shows prior to the A and M game last year. Um sort of on the road and, and in-person show on, on that Friday. Uh, I think we were in Lexington uh, that day. And I uh, I just remember consistently saying, well, on paper, <laughs> South Carolina doesn't have the advantage here. And then on paper, South Carolina doesn't have the advantage in this area. And then on paper, South – and I remember just at the end of the show, I was like, dang, we just repeated ourselves about every single matchup in this game. Um, and then the, to me, the actual game, I don't really remember many plays from that game last year. I remember um, the drop pass early on on a deep ball. Uh, great throw from Colin Hill that, that gets dropped. And I just remember looking around williams Bryce Stadium and the complete look, not of shock, not of disbelief, but of just... I'm over this from a large portion of the fan base. And I remember at that point, it's sinking in. South Carolina is going to have a coaching change because this is like probably not going to be a fixable situation. And then I remember us starting to hear that week, um, if I remember correctly, there were rumors that it was going to happen like like ASAP at the time, and obviously that didn't happen. But I, I firmly believe the first half of that game was, I don't want to say the beginning of the end because I think the beginning of the end had already probably happened. Mm-hmm. But that was getting close to the end of the end, um, in my opinion of the Will Muschamp era. Yeah, and and the beginning of the end, like you said, Wes, I think was, I mean, LSU realistically, right? Because, you know, South Carolina lost the game to Tennessee to begin the year, and that had been so built up for good reason. That that was like, there was reason to build that game up. They lose it in devastating fashion. They lose to Florida. They destroy Vandy. They get the big win over Auburn, right? And so then you're two and two, and, is it going to turn around? Well, it didn't. They, they lose badly to LSU, gave up 52 points to an LSU team that wasn't very good. And that was when it kind of started. I, I remember, because you, for context, you go into that year, you think, okay, not no matter what, but barring something really crazy, there's not going to be a coaching change this year at South Carolina because of COVID, all those different things. And I remember asking some folks after the LSU game and kind of repeating that. Well, it's still – there's not going to be changes, right? I realize that was bad. I realize where things are at. I realize the fan frustration. But there's not going to be a change, right, because of that. And it kind of came back. When you lose like that, it can change things. And so that was kind of like you said, man, the beginning of the end. Then you go to A&M. They couldn't do anything. They were down 41 nothing. They lose 48 to three, just got blasted. And that was um yeah, I, I don't remember many plays either, Wes. I remember AM scoring a lot and, and South Carolina not doing much of anything. Could couldn't do anything on the ground, couldn't do anything through the air. And uh just just a thorough beatdown. So here's the thing, man. I, I think obviously this is a different team, two different teams in different years. But the common denominator is I, I do still look at this game. And when you do the on paper thing, this matchup versus this matchup, there's still not a lot to like for South Carolina in this one, you know, and then, and then you factor in the road. Now the saving grace is, you know, Mark, Mark Passwater's mentioned that A&M has kind of hit its stride and that could be, I don't put a ton of stock in the Missouri game. Missouri isn't very good. 
especially on defense. And then you look at what they did early in the season. They weren't very impressive. They struggled against Colorado, who's bad. But they beat Alabama at home, you know. So ch chances are that this A&M team is the team that we saw against Bama and that we saw last week because they're pretty darn talented. They're pretty darn talented. And so um, there's there's a lot to consider going into this one. But it's a game that when you do the on-paper thing, there's lots of concerns for South Carolina, especially with how they struggled offensively. Yeah, and I when I I tell you what, when I think of the beginning of the end for Will Muschamp, I actually go all the way back to the loss. There's two losses that are are very similar losses, and I'm not sure which one should be the beginning of the end. I go all the way back. I'll go back at least to that North Carolina loss to open the season. Um, you know because you're going up against really one of your mentors. And, uh, and and as Jamie points out on Facebook, he says the belt bowl, you know, I, I yep. I'm back and forth on that. I, I, the belt bowl was a low moment, but unless, unless you, unless you're talking about like an opportunity to win like a BCS bowl or obviously to win a, a bowl in the playoffs, sometimes, Sometimes teams just play poorly in a bowl game. Like it, it doesn't always really have an exact. Uh, it's not really an exact representation sometimes of of a team or a program or anything like that. So I could excuse the bowl game because I still felt like South Carolina as a program had done some some good things, but then you know and really overachieved uh, at least the first two years of of Muschamp's tenure, but. After what fans experienced going to Charlotte for the Belk Bowl, then going back to Charlotte and playing a North Carolina team that was in game one of a new coaching staff. And, you know, with a veteran quarterback for South Carolina against a, a freshman quarterback in Sam Howell. Um, not that we have to go back and go all through that game, but but to me, the 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 – Overall mood, the vibe of the fan base, it was sort of, you know, at the end of, after the belt bowl, but it just turned after yeah. the UNC game, in my opinion. So, you yeah. know, I, I think um, to Chris's point, I think from an administrative standpoint, um, you know, that, that LSU game was probably when it kind of started because you kind of had, there was a COVID factor here, right, last year that, oh, there's not going to be any changes during a COVID season. Um, but as far as the fan mood and vibe and all that stuff, to me, that North Carolina game was the day that I – I looked around looking at some of the reactions, and it felt to me like it was stronger than just your typical, my team lost and I'm pissed off. It was more of like, a, I don't – I think I'm I – don't, I don't think this is going to work mindset. Yeah, that, that was a huge one. And and so much, you know, you remember that year and that 2020 recruiting cycle, West. there ended up being some head-to-head -head battles with UNC. So we knew that we knew that was going to be the case and we knew there was going to be some potential on-field carryover from that. And, and that game was all lined up and then you lose it. And then, like you said, that was back-to-back -back games in Charlotte. You just had the belt bowl. And so it kind of signaled – is there any progress being made here because or are they going backwards because here's North Carolina, here's Mac Brown. And then this, this happens. And then, you know, you get into a situation the following year after a four game, you know, you win four games and you go into the following year, you know, it, it's, yeah, there's a lot of factors and there's COVID, but you just, you get into a situation against LSU and A&M where the team's just not even competitive anymore. And then you've got the fan, vitriol and apathy or whatever and all those things really lumped in you know different camps and they just had to make a change so certainly the AM game last year not a lot of fond memories from it um and it's you know going back to this year Wes and this this year's game huge challenge I mean I think similar in some ways to last year because you've got a team that's struggling offensively going to college station playing on the road that's going to be tough and a and M's got a lot of offensive talent in terms of their skill guys, so a big challenge, no doubt about it. It won't have any 
big long term, you know, implications for the Shane Beamer era in year one at all. I don't think, um, but it's still still a challenging contest. Let, let me ask you all a question, then we're going to get out of here. Anybody in the chat? Anybody listening? Um, is, is progress in this game maybe compared to last year? Does, does that matter? I mean, does I, I don't I don't I don't get the sense, Chris, that there's going to be many Gamecocks predicting South Carolina wins this game. You know, I, I think in in a lot of situations, you go into a game as a small underdog. There's going to be a portion of fans who um, are going to call for their team to win the game, and you can convince yourself of about anything when it comes to a college football game if you if you focus on you know enough things that maybe on paper point in your team's direction. This game, South Carolina, um, more than a two touchdown, uh, really two touchdowns and a field goal plus underdogs. Most South Carolina fans are not going to pick Carolina to win this game, especially after uh, the very narrow win over Vanderbilt this past week. So my, my question is, if you're a fan, think back to how you felt last year. Again, uh, A&M wins 48-3. to um, Chris, do you remember what that game was at, uh, at halftime? Um, it was actually, it was 21-0 at the half. I, for some reason, I thought it was even worse than that because I remember at halftime just thinking this has been an absolute disaster from a, from a South Carolina standpoint. But, dude, I, I'll, I'll go back. That The interesting thing about this series, South Carolina has not beaten A&M. Um, but, you know, even year one under Muschamp, I remember with, with Perry uh, playing quite a bit uh, or Perry maybe coming off the bench in this game, I remember what AJ Turner had a big run early on. South Carolina hung around in that game. Um, did they muff a punt when they were getting the ball back um, in in that that first year? I, I think they did. I think they were about to get the ball back down eight and, and muffed a punt, if I remember correctly. But doesn't matter. Point being, South Carolina, even though they've been outmanned by A and M for a few years, really just hung in against a and I, I remember them going down early to A&M and, and Jake Bentley getting hot in the second half, um, you know, uh, a handful of years ago. I remember them going up 17-7 to at A&M. Um, maybe year 17, two? 2017, yep. Yeah, yeah. But the last two seasons, it's really – it's been two games that just have not – really been close and it, you know the, the offense has not been able to do anything against a and m you know two years ago at a and m I, I think the defense from what i remember sort of kept south sort of hung in there and a and m couldn't quite put the game away and then they did put it away at the end but the yeah. offense just couldn't get anything on track so my question is if you're a fan out there and chris i you know i want your opinion as well is prog is progress rewarded in a game like this? Like if South Carolina goes and and hangs in there and makes it a fourth quarter game, even or, or do y'all see progression in that, or do, or does it have to be a, a W? Because I I I don't really think if we're being realistic, you can look at this game and just expect South Carolina to go win the game. Um, you know, you need to hope that. A&M reverts back to some of the offensive issues they've had yeah. earlier in the year, shoots themselves in the foot a bit. Maybe uh, maybe they start reading their own clippings a, a little bit. Carolina's defense turns them over a couple of times, as we've seen they can do, and that you just hang around and, and go into the fourth quarter um, with the game sort of still hanging in the balance. Yeah, and I think that's what it would take, Wes. I mean, you know, th this game on the road against this team and kind of some of the talent differential that's in play, I don't think you would expect South Carolina to just line up and win this one, right? And that's why, like you said, most people or probably everybody's pick in this one is going to be A&M. But I do think you can demonstrate some progress. I, I do think you can. That doesn't mean you have to be okay with losing or happy with losing. Keeping the perspective that it is year one, and now we've got kind of a sample size of what this team is. Some areas that are better than we thought, some that are definitely worse than we thought they would be. 
not being okay with that if you're a Gamecock fan, but understanding it and understanding that, okay, given this, what's reasonable to expect in the A&M game or maybe the rest of the year. And so it uh, doesn't mean you have to be okay with it. Maybe you, sh- maybe you expect to go to college station in, in year three or five and win. Maybe you expect that this year you probably don't. And so I do think you can demonstrate some progress and a lot of that West, the way that people are going to measure that is what does the offense look like? Just because that's been so much of the, the talking points going in for good reason. There's an understanding. I think that this defense which has played well at times, probably going to give up some points to A&M. But I think people to measure progress want to see South Carolina go to College Station and be able to move the ball some, be able to put the ball in the end zone some. I think that would measure progress. And I I feel like a good portion of the fan base would would understand that and recognize that too. Yep, so we'll see, man. One more show uh, to go on Friday, and then it'll be South Carolina versus Texas A&M on Saturday night. Uh, for Chris Clark, I am Wes Mitchell. We appreciate all of you joining us. Before we go, Chris, you want to tell everybody about Dead Soxy? Yep, let's tell everybody about Dead Soxy. Go to deadsoxy.com and get use the promo code COCKY, C-O-C-K-Y. To get 25% off your order, check out their extensive catalog of men's and women's socks, all with the buttery soft feel and patented no-slip technology. Thanks, for Dead so- Thanks to Dead Soxy for being a part of GC Live. All right, guys, uh, for Chris, I'm Wes. Uh, appreciate the support, as always, and I uh, want to invite you all back to uh, come hang out with us on Friday afternoon, and uh, then, of course, come hang out with us on GamecockCentral.com on Saturday for the game. Uh, we'll see you on Friday. Hope you all have a good one.